Good morning. Uh, my name is David Palkey. I am the academic advisor for Seminar 9. And the, uh, thank you, and the assistant course director for this course. Uh, today we have the privilege, uh, the pleasure of our first guest lecturer in Foundations of Strategy, uh, Dr. Jeff Knopf. Uh, Dr. Knopf is coming, he has a PhD from Stanford, uh, uh, undergrad uh, from Harvard uh, in social studies, his PhD is in political science. Uh, he's taught a number of places at the University of Southern California, Naval Postgraduate School for a number of years, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and he is currently at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So he comes here at great sacrifice, leaving, uh, le leaving Monterey, California to come here to, to speak to us. Uh, he's previously the editor of the Nonproliferation Review uh, at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation -prolif Studies. A nonproliferation review is a major journal in the field that everyone who reads about nuclear weapons deterrence nonproliferation is, is well acquainted with. Uh, he's the author and editor of uh, numerous books, uh, journal articles, and book chapters, uh, including uh, several books on my shelf, one on uh, nuclear uh, on assurance, the role of assurance in, uh, in, in, in deterrence, uh, but, but the book is solely on assurance that came out a few years ago. Fantastic book, a recent book on international cooperation on WMD proliferation, uh, and so forth. Uh, we invited him out today to speak to you on the different waves of deterrence theory. In 2010, he published an article, The Fourth Wave in Deterrence Research, uh, in the journal uh, Contemporary Security Policy. Uh, this article won the Bernard Brody Prize for the best article in this journal for that year, and has it gained him quite a bit of scholarly attention. Uh, uh, thrilled to have him out. Can we please welcome with him with a big round of applause? Thank you, David. Good morning. <laughs> Wonderful to see everybody. So as, as David mentioned, I taught for a number of years at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, but despite the uh, Navy name in the title, uh, the particular program that I taught in um, was very heavy with Air Force officers. So uh, very familiar with uh, the Air Force. I uh, know that um, uh, you guys uh, have a lot of very smart officers and invest a lot in the education, so it's a real pleasure to get back uh, to an opportunity to talk to some of you. Um, so you'll have to forgive me if I occasionally look over my, oh, I can look in the back to see the slides, good. So that way I can actually remind myself what I put into this uh, slide deck in the end, and we'll see if we can get the technology to work as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about deterrence, um, surprise, surprise, uh, and uh, I want to try to do um, probably three big things today. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about is uh, just kind of very conceptual. When we talk about deterrence, what are we talking about? What are the different ways of defining deterrence? Um, what are some of the different uh, versions of, of deterrence, the different forms that it can take? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, or well, actually a lot, about the uh, evolution of academic research on deterrence and how the, the um, thinking about deterrence has uh, progressed over the years, uh, and I'm going to make a few very brief comments about the nuclear role because I know nuclear deterrence is pretty central to the uh, education and mission of a lot of people here. Um, so let's see how this goes. Good. All right. So here is the uh, the plan, and hopefully I will leave some time for questions at the end. Actually, David, how long how long uh, should I talk? In 45. Okay. So I want to start by just talking about deterrence before there was any theory of deterrence, right? Um, uh, deterrence has been around for a long time. This is not some brand new thing that we invented with the nuclear age. So if you're familiar with the old Roman adage, uh, and I do not know how to pronounce Latin, but si vis pacum parabellum, if you want peace, prepare for war. That's essentially a version of deterrence, right? If you are so strong uh, that you can defeat any adversary, the hope is the adversaries won't mess with you. They will be deterred. So we've been practicing deterrence in international relations, in statecraft, uh, since long before we had any theorizing about deterrence. And it's not something which is limited just to the realm of military strategy. In fact, the word deterrence uh, was coined originally 
uh, in its role as uh, a technique for trying to reduce crime. So, for example, the reason that we have prisons, including, as I just learned about a minute ago, one right here on the base, um, it was the belief that if you threaten people with a loss of freedom and time in jail, um, it would deter them from committing crimes. So deterrence is, is much broader than uh, the military realm. Uh, and in fact, you can see uh, examples that are not just limited to human beings, but throughout the animal uh, and plant kingdoms. Um, one of my favorite books, maybe my favorite book on deterrence, is a very short uh, primer just called Deterrence, uh, written by a very senior British academic, Lawrence Friedman. Uh, and he has a wonderful example of a particular kind of moth that evolved so that the pattern on the wings of the moth um, looks like the eyes of a particular kind of owl. And the owl is the main predator that hunts the, the other smaller birds that would otherwise eat this moth. And so when they see the, what looks like the owl face on the moth, they are deterred from eating the moth because they're afraid it's an owl. So um, you don't even have to be uh, a sentient uh, you know, thinking individual to practice deterrence. It can be purely uh, evolutionary. Okay. Um, so although the practice is ancient, widespread, um, we have not had very much theorizing about deterrence until a whole lot um, more recently. So one of the things I like to sort of point out to people, if you pick up your copy of Clausewitz, which I'm sure all of you have on your bookshelf uh, on war, right? there's a big section about offensive operations, there's a big section about defensive operations, there's no section on deterrence because strategic thinkers just didn't really think about deterrence prior to the 20th century. Um, the effort to start theorizing about deterrence really comes with the invention of military aircraft. Right after World War I, um, there was a, a British prime minister who expressed the opinion, the bomber will always get through. Uh, we now know that that was not uh, correct, but because they did not have uh, figured out yet how to do air defenses, um, uh, there was a feeling that the only way to prevent an adversary from engaging in aerial attacks on your city uh, your cities was going to be to threaten to retaliate in kind, so again, a form of deterrence. Um, but no surprise to anybody here, the thing that really, really makes people sit down, you know, wake up and say, you know, we really have to think about deterrence is the invention of the atom bomb. With that, uh, all the thinking changes and deterrence becomes a really paramount mission, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. So let's think about uh, definition, right? And here's a pretty standard definition. I think I have a photo. Here we go. So that's Jeremy Bentham. Uh, Jeremy Bentham was a famous uh, English uh, utilitarian philosopher. Uh, he coined the term deterrence, and as I mentioned, he coined it in the context of trying to convince, uh, come, trying to come up with a rational way to convince people not to commit crime, right? And so this will be a pretty, uh, you know, if you pick up your favorite dictionary, you're going to get a definition that looks a lot like this, right? It's about making a threat. Uh, but the threat is conditional. If you do something I don't like, then there will be consequences. Uh, and the idea is to threaten consequences um, such that the costs of the action will outweigh the benefits of the action for the person, for the actor uh, who's doing it. And that's a very, very standard generic definition of deterrence. I think it's fine. I don't, I don't think it's uh, wrong. Uh, but it builds into it by talking about costs and benefits in the definition. Uh, it builds into it a very strong assumption that we're dealing with rational actors. Uh, and we may want to allow ourselves to soften that assumption. So my preferred definition takes the words costs and benefits out. And we'll, I'll give you a second cut in a minute. Okay. So in our context, um, we're primarily interested in deterrence uh, in its role as a strategy. Uh, and unfortunately, this is one of those you know, words um, you know, it has Latin uh, roots, but, but in its English usage is, you know, a typical English um, uh, somewhat ambiguous word. So deterrence can refer to an outcome. Uh, deterrence was achieved, the other side didn't act. Right? But, but for our purposes, we're interested in the deliberate use of deterrence as a strategy. We're going to practice deterrence in hopes that we also achieve the outcome of deterrence. Okay. And as I said, the theorizing uh, and, and much of the military practice uh, has been driven by nuclear weapons. Uh, and that has the, I think in my mind, um, somewhat unfortunate consequence that it, it attaches a lot of connotations to the word. Right? There's a lot of baggage with deterrence because of the nuclear uh, Cold War experience where you say deterrence and most people immediately think the bomb. 
uh, and particular sort of strategies that were prominent in the uh, first decades of the Cold War, massive retaliation, mutual assured destruction. Um, so those are particular ways of practicing deterrence in, a, in one particular context, but they're not the definition of the, det of the term. Deterrence is a lot broader uh, than just what we do with nuclear weapons. So if you were to pick up some of the um, academic international relations textbooks um, and they talk about deterrence in the context of military strategy, you would get a definition like this one. This is one I took from, from Patrick Morgan, who's done some really wonderful work uh, on this topic. Right? It's uh, issuing a threat of military retaliation in order to prevent a military attack by another state. Right, so that also builds in a lot of assumptions into the definition of deterrence, that the means you're using are military, uh, that the end you want to achieve uh, is to prevent a military a uh, attack, uh, and that the actor you want to deter is another state. Um, uh, in today's world, we don't necessarily make any of those three assumptions. Right? We could be practicing deterrence as a form of national strategy without any of those three pieces uh, necessarily being true. So we still need to go broader. Okay, so for example, um, we might try to, to persuade somebody not to take an unwanted action by threatening to impose economic sanctions uh, or by threatening to um, create a condition of diplomatic isolation or by threatening some kind of cyber response, right? This could still be deterrent and we're not using uh, kinetic, you know, military force. Um, maybe we're trying to persuade somebody that they should not give assistance to terrorism so we're not trying to deter them from attacking us. We're trying to deter them from aiding somebody else who wants to attack us. That's still deterrence. But we might be trying to deter terrorists themselves. So non-state actors can be targets of deterrence. Right? So we need a way of thinking about this term that strips away a lot of the baggage we have because of the uh, kind of nuclear era origins of this term. It's not just nuclear weapons. It's not just military means. It's not just states as targets, you know, et cetera. Okay. So here's my preferred uh, definition of deterrence. I'll let, give you a second to enjoy the, the visual here. Um, uh, I, I'm not the person who found this slide originally. I inherited it from uh, somebody who um, uh, taught our intro to WMD proliferation class before me, but it's just too delightful not to use over and, and over again. Um, two different threats there, right? Um, death, and if that's not enough, you'll have to pay a fine. So to me, any working definition of deterrence is going to have three essential features. Uh, the goal of deterrence is primarily to prevent something. Uh, and in a second, I'll introduce a, 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 an alternative form of strategy called compellence, right? Sometimes we want to force somebody to take an action they're not taking yet or to stop an action that they've started. Typically, we're not going to call that deterrence. Deterrence is we have some reason to think that somebody else is contemplating doing something but they haven't started it yet, they haven't done it yet, and we want to talk them out of it before they start. So deterrence aims to prevent an action that from our point of view is unwanted. Uh, and I will say, and maybe this is because of you know, um, uh, us all being uh, citizens of the global uh, superpower, um, we always tend to talk about deterrence from the point of view of the deterrer, right, and not the deterree, but we could turn all these things around. Somebody's trying to keep us from doing something, they're trying to deter us. Um, if deterrence works, it works through the mechanism of influencing the decision making of the target actor. Uh, so there's a, a famous distinction that people use different terms to, to make the distinction, but between um, what we might call an influence strategy, uh, I'm trying to influence another uh, uh, decision maker, and deterrence is one form of influence strategy, uh, and what uh, Thomas Schelling called brute force, or, or Lawrence Friedman is called control strategies. Right? Sometimes we want to just impose our will on somebody else take away all freedom of choice from them uh, and just impose an outcome on them, right? So uh, if you think about President uh, Reagan's original uh, vision of the Strategic Defense Initiative, that it was going to be this perfect uh, Astrodome missile defense and no ICBM could get through it, right? That's not deterrence. That's a control strategy. Go ahead and launch your missiles. They won't get through. The um, uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, we're going to uh, invade the country, uh, occupy the country, overthrow the government, disband the military, um, all in the search for those uh, alleged WMD. That's a control strategy, right? We didn't leave Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government any choice about what was going to happen. 
Um, control strategies are very attractive because you want to be able to impose your will on other people, but they tend to cost a lot. Uh, and they can be very high risk if things don't turn out the way you, you hoped they would. Um, so given that we can't just invade every country in the world every time we're unhappy with something they're doing, um, sometimes we have to fall back on trying to influence their thinking instead. So deterrence is, is uh, an attempt to hopefully avoid the actual use of military force by influencing the other side and how they're thinking. Uh, and then the final defining uh, characteristic of deterrence uh, is that deterrence uh, tries to exert influence uh, primarily by highlighting the negative things uh, that might happen. So deterrence works by essentially uh, projecting to the other side a set of consequences or a set of results that they might get um, that would be bad from their point of view. Um, so this is where I'm kind of smuggling costs and benefits back in, but trying not to use the language of costs and benefits. But that's, that's the idea here. Um, I anticipate that if I do X, um, it will end badly for me, and therefore I will decide not to do X, and I have now been uh, deterred. We could try to influence people in other ways, right? We could offer them positive inducements, um, bribe them, basically. Um, we could try to reassure them that their fears are unfounded. Um, we could try to just persuade them through reason and logic or appeals to shared moral values. That's not deterrence. It, it could be a form of influence, but those are alternatives to deterrence. So deterrence is one type of influence strategy in a big toolkit, in a big menu uh, of different choices that people have. Okay. So let me um, take you through some of the um, kind of basic um, terminology that's very common in the field. So I already mentioned the difference between um, uh, deterrence and compellence. This is all language that comes from Thomas Schelling, who uh, I think is by far the most influential and important of all the deterrence theorists. Uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, passed away only within the last few years. Um, so he talked about coercion as a kind of umbrella term. There's a set of strategies that use threats to try to influence people. We can call these coercive strategies. And coercive strategies basically come uh, in two uh, basic flavors, deterrent and compellent. Deterrent seeks to prevent an action that hasn't happened yet. Uh, compellence, uh, in contrast, tries to force somebody to actually do something, to start doing something that they're not yet doing, uh, or to stop or reverse doing something that they've already started. Um, and uh, ever since Schelling, we've always sort of assumed that of the two tasks, compellence is somewhat harder because um, when the other side gives in, it's much more visible, whereas with deterrence, you can kind of say, oh, I was falsely accused. I wasn't planning to attack you and kind of back down in a way that allows you to save face. Um, but both of them can succeed or fail, but, but over a large number of attempts, you're probably going to have a higher success ratio with deterrence than compellence. Okay. Um, so that's sort of an academic distinction. In practice, uh, the boundary can be incredibly blurry between these two. So suppose you have a state that is a state sponsor of terrorism, and you say to them, stop supporting terrorism. Right? Are you deterring them from future steps to aid terrorism, or are you compelling them to stop a relationship that already uh, exists? It's kind of a little uh, unclear. So in practice, um, we tend to think that we're implementing deterrence, Targets often tend to perceive it as compellence. Why are you forcing me to do something I don't want to do? Um, but at least intellectually, we can make the distinction between whether we think we're trying to prevent something uh, or we're trying to force something to happen. Oh, there's the cover of, of Schelling's most famous book, uh, Arms and Influence. Okay. So another really big distinction, and this one... Um, uh, was also introduced by a very uh, influential political scientist named Glenn Snyder, um, also no longer uh, with us. Um, and he said that deterrence really comes itself in two different versions, which he called punishment and denial. So deterrence by punishment, I think, is what really springs to mind uh, initially when we talk about deterrence. Right? I will retaliate against your action in some way that inflicts costs on you such that the costs outweigh the benefits. Um, so if you think about deterrence, again, in the, the context of preventing crime, um, fines like a speeding ticket, um, threats to send somebody to jail, the death penalty, right? Those are all deterrent messages. Don't commit crime. Here are the bad things that could happen to you. Uh, but Snyder said that there's another way of practicing deterrence, which he called deterrence by denial, um, which is really more about denying benefits. 
Right. If you are going to take some action, uh, uh, you, the other side, presumably it's because you think there's some gains to be achieved in that action, some benefits you want to get. But what if it turns out that I can respond in ways that cause you to fail? You launch an attack because you want to seize some territory, but I can defend the territory, and at the end of your operation, you didn't gain any territory. You got no benefits from your action. Right. This prospect of failure, this prospect that you won't get the, the hoped for benefits, should also exercise deterrent effect. Again, the other side's costs will outweigh their benefits because they expend all the costs to try and attack, but the attack fails and they generate no benefits. And we do this all the time in crime prevention as well. Locks on our doors, um, security patrols around the neighborhood, um, all the things we do since I just you know flew yesterday, right? All the TSA stuff we all go through that's meant to be deterrent. It'll be harder to hijack the airplane than it was uh, 17 years ago. Okay. Um, and although both of these exist, I think our mental image is really punishment, right? So if, if you read somebody and they're writing about deterrence and they don't define what type of deterrence they're talking about, implicitly they're probably assuming deterrence by punishment. Usually when people write about deterrence by denial, they're going to spell it out to specify that that's what they're talking about. Now, Snyder introduced this distinction specifically in reference to nuclear weapons. And the gist of his argument is a really big picture historical argument was in the pre-nuclear age, with conventional weapons only, deterrence is primarily deterrence by denial. Right? Think about that Roman adage, if you want peace, prepare for war. That's deterrence by denial. You can attack me, but I can defend myself. And my defenses are so strong that I'll win and you'll lose. And so why bother? Right? That's deterrence by uh, denial. And that was how military deterrence was traditionally practiced, which is why if you're Clausewitz, you can just write about def the defense. And if your defenses are strong, uh, deterrence is just a bonus side benefit. You don't have to think about it. But Snyder argued that nuclear weapons changed the equation. Right? At the time he was writing, and I think it's still largely true today, nobody had really figured out a way to create truly effective defenses against nuclear attacks. Really, nuclear weapons plus <coughs> ballistic missiles, that's really the combination. Right? Um, the bomber may not always get through, but as far as we know, the ICBM is going to get through. And if it doesn't, then maybe the cruise missile will get through. Right? Um, so you can't count on being able to defend yourself effectively enough to prevent at least some nuclear weapons from striking their targets. Right? Deterrence by denial, no longer feasible. Hence, we're shifting to a world in which deterrence at the nuclear level has to be based primarily on the threat of punishment. Right? And here's where we start to get um, the language of things like second strike survivable forces and so forth. Um, if I'm going to deter you from thinking about using your nuclear weapons against me or against my friends or against my allies, um, you know, I can't say I can defend against a nuclear attack. What I have to do instead is say is I can retaliate after a nuclear attack and I can impose a nuclear cost on you such that it's not worth it for you uh, to start a nuclear war. Okay. Um, this has always been controversial. Right, there has always been a subset of strategists who deny this. Right, so this is associated with uh, the larger thesis of the nuclear revolution, that nuclear weapons or the combination of nuclear weapons and, and long-range missiles represents a revolution in military affairs that fundamentally alters how we have to think about strategy. That has been uh, in the uh, academic uh, community that studies these things. That's been the majority mainstream position really all along. Okay. But there's always been people who've pushed back and said, no, uh, traditional conventional ways of thinking about strategy still apply here. We can find ways to do uh, deterrence by denial. Uh, uh, people are even more ambitious or, or more provocative, if you will, might even argue we can find ways to do nuclear war fighting. Uh, but that's always been the minority position. That's sort of the dissident position in this realm. So that's kind of the stage one of the presentation, right? What is deterrence? What's the history of it? Um, why did we start theorizing about it? How do we define it? What are some different uh, forms of deterrence and coercion that exist? 
Um, so let me uh, now switch gears a little bit, and I want to take you through, uh, and this is going to be really, I don't know, 40,000 foot level, uh, uh, you know, not just bird's eye overview, satellite uh, level overview of academic research. Um, we, uh, people in, in the academic world, uh, including me, uh, as David mentioned, um, divide the efforts to do research on deterrence uh, up uh, into different time periods, which we describe as different waves of deterrence research, and we're now um, well into what I and some other people have designated the fourth wave of deterrence research. Okay, so, uh, so the first wave of deterrence research begins uh, immediately after World War II, uh, and as I mentioned, it is driven uh, solely by the fact that the atom bomb has been invented, and people now have to make sense uh, of this a revolutionary new type of weapon. So that's a slightly distorted photo of a gentleman named Bernard Brody. Uh, Bernard Brody is probably the most important uh, figure in the first wave of deterrence research. Um, and that's his, his most famous quotation there. Right? Uh, he wrote this in 1947. No hydrogen bomb yet, just atom bombs. Only the United States had nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union hadn't joined the arms race yet. So most of us think, like, wow, that guy was really prescient. You know, what he wrote was basically, you know, in the past, the reason you had a military establishment was to fight wars if you had to and to try to win those wars. But we really, 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 really don't want to fight a nuclear war. Right? That's just too destructive. And so that changes how we think about military strategy. The goal has to be not to figure out how to win the next war. The goal has to be to figure out how to avoid the next war. And that, in practice, is going to end up meaning mostly deterrence. Right? We have to come up with some kind of strategy, uh, some kind of doctrine, some kind of force posture, uh, such that we exercise effective deterrence. Nobody wants to push the button. Nobody wants to start a nuclear war. Okay. So the first wave of research is really barely research at all. It's really just kind of a policy prescription. Nuclear weapons change everything. In the past, we focused on winning wars. Now we have to focus on deterring wars, at least at the nuclear level. Um, but it doesn't say very much yet about how we do this. There's not much theory yet. There's really just a policy insight, like, we better think about this. Okay. So the second wave starts you know, sometime in the 1950s, and I think most of us would run it through probably about the mid-1970s. And the second wave is where all the initial spade work gets done. Everybody starts to think through and theorize about nuclear weapons. Right? And in the second wave, Thomas Schelling is really the giant, and I've already you know, mentioned him. Right? And the second wave um, focuses very strongly on the rational actor assumption. And it does this for a number of reasons. Um, one is a good reason. Um, we don't have any historical cases of a two-sided nuclear war. Right? After 1945, after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, thank God nuclear weapons are never used again. Um, very good for the world. Um, really crap for social science researchers because we have no cases to study. Right? So um, we can't look historically at the cases and examine what went wrong, how come deterrence failed. We can only sit in our armchairs and theorize about what might have led deterrence to succeed, what might lead it to fail. Right? And so uh, assuming rational actors is a very um, uh, nice assumption from the point of view of letting us kind of sit in our armchairs and theorize about, well, if I was the rational actor, what would I do? You know, another reason for this was that the Soviet Union was a very opaque actor at the time. Right. Over time, they progress we progressively learned more about them, but in the 1950s, you know, it's still Stalin in the early part of this time. Right. Think North Korea today, right? Really tough to figure out how they think. So since we don't have a lot of information about how they think, let's just assume they're a rational actor because we better hope that that's true. Okay. And the other fact that was going on at the time was that this was when um, uh, the branch of... Um, uh, theorizing called game theory was really coming online and was super hot and, and faddish and, and game theory is built on sort of rational actor assumptions and so it began in economics but it made sense to kind of pick it up out of economics and apply it to nuclear strategy. Right. So with these assumptions of rational actors calculating costs and benefits in a fairly generic uniform kind of way 
uh, in which the costs of suffering nuclear retaliation would clearly outweigh any benefits you could hope to obtain from any form of aggression, people then sort of said, well, what would be the conditions for effective deterrence? Right? And so we get things that you're hopefully all familiar with, that having survivable second strike nuclear forces is the key, that what you really want to do is maintain stability uh, and not create uh, crisis instability by having forces that could threaten an effective first strike on somebody else because then you put them in a use them or lose them situation where in a crisis they're going to feel they have to launch first rather than suffer preemption. Uh, and the only thing here that's at all kind of uh, sort of a sticky wicket and, and hard to do is how do you persuade the other side that you mean it, right? That, that you are willing uh, to do things that might lead somebody else to rain down nuclear weapons on your territory. Uh, and in particular, for uh, the United States, uh, we have sort of a unique problem. Right? We have all of these extended deterrence commitments. So I didn't introduce the term extended deterrence, but hopefully you know it, right? You can, uh, who's the object that is supposed to be protected by deterrence? So you can have what might be called central or homeland or direct deterrence. I'm protecting my own home territory from attack. Most people think that's inherently credible, right? If somebody nukes you, you're probably just going to nuke them back. That's reasonably believable. Okay. Extended deterrence. I now have various friends and allies that I've made commitments to out in the world. And I'm extending my, sometimes people use the term nuclear umbrella, I'm extending my nuclear umbrella to protect them against nuclear threats. That's not quite so believable, right? The Soviet Union threatens West Germany. Um, Warsaw Pact tanks are sort of rolling uh, into West Germany. Uh, we're losing at the conventional level. We say, okay, we're going to escalate to the nuclear level first and lob a few tactical nukes at those uh, Warsaw Pact troop formations. But in doing that, maybe the Soviet Union launches nuclear weapons at the United States. Is it believable that we would be willing to do that? Right? A lot of people doubted that. Um, uh, Charles de Gaulle, who was the president of France for many years, uh, was very fond of going around saying to everybody, I don't believe that the United States is willing to sacrifice Washington to save Paris. Right? And that's why France needed its own nuclear deterrent, because it wasn't going to trust the United States. Okay. So the United States is stuck with this problem that we have all of these extended deterrence commitments, and we want Moscow, we want the Soviet Union to believe them, so we had to make them credible. So most, in practice, most of the hard work in the second wave of deterrence research focuses on credibility. What are the things you can do to make your deterrent threats credible? And, and Schelling and other theorists threw out all sorts of uh, different suggestions. Um, I think some of them have them on the next slide. So as I mentioned, this is kind of the mainstream wisdom. The goal here is to maintain stability convince everybody not to use nuclear weapons. The way to do that is to have survivable second strike forces. And the reason that works is that it, everybody's going to be a rational actor. Okay. Those are a lot of really powerful assumptions. Uh, there was a lot of, of strategists who didn't accept all of those assumptions and pushed back. So there was always a strand of the research that emphasized the need for escalation dominance, for war fighting strategies, and so forth. Uh, if you want to kind of lead exemplar of that from the 1960s, it would probably be Herman Kahn, um, who was in some ways the uh, uh, model for the Dr. Strangelove character in the movie Dr. Strangelove. Okay. So credibility, that's the big one, right? Uh, oftentimes, I think we fall back on a very simple formula that, that equates credibility to reputation. If I've acted tough in the past, People will know that I keep my word, that when I, when I make a threat, I implement it. And hence, by developing a reputation over time for keeping my word, for implementing my threats, my threats will be credible. Um, forming that kind of reputation may be one ingredient of credibility or one approach to trying to establish credibility. Uh, but it turns out that's not the only part, that credibility actually uh, uh, has more components than that uh, and can, can, be, can be conveyed uh, in other ways. Um, but establishing that sense of resolve, that sense that you will keep your word, that you will implement your threats, that's always been the hardest part. There's the De Gaulle, De Gaulle quote. Um, over time, the research community has kind of looked at uh, sort of three baskets of things that might help establish credibility. Right? Maybe credibility is really a function of the stakes themselves. 
the more the thing you're trying to protect matters to you, the more vital the stakes, logically, the more credible the deterrent threat should be. Right? And if you're trying to prevent somebody from doing something that you really don't care about, it's very hard to make those deterrent threats credible, right? So maybe they're just a feature of the geopolitics of the situation. Are the interests at stake sufficiently obvious to everybody that they assume you'll carry them out? Um, establishing a, rep a reputation, I've talked about that already, right? Uh, following a pattern of behavior over time such that you, you develop an image for keeping your word, for implementing your threats. Um, the other thing that, that Schelling and a lot of people looked at is what we might call commitment tactics. Are there little tricks that we can do um, that would sort of add to the sense of resolve? So for example, having forward deployed troops as a tripwire has been a common one. Yeah, we'll station a few troops on the, the border, uh, East German, West German border. Um, it's not nearly enough to stop the Soviets from invaded, but because Americans will be killed on day one of an invasion, you know, we'll have skin in the game. That will make our commitments uh, more credible. Um, making your comments in public to create uh, what are called domestic audience costs. Think uh, President Obama uh, announcing that Syrian use of chemical weapons would cross a red line for him. Right? You could communicate that message in private. Hello, President Assad, don't use chemicals or else. But when you say it in public, you commit your national prestige. When you say it in public, you know that you'll have a bunch of critics domestically who get on your case if you don't implement the threat. And that's meant, uh, done in part, to convey that I really mean this threat, that I'm going to take it seriously. Okay, in that case, uh, it didn't end up being implemented, uh, and it didn't end up working either. Um, so even when we do the things that are supposed to commit uh, our credibility, it doesn't always work. So what have we learned from the academic research? Um, we've learned that uh, it's really hard to figure out when threats will be seen as credible and when they're not, and that none of the um, alleged sources of resolve is completely reliable. Um, there's been a big body of research that really challenges the importance of reputation that basically says, for the most part, it's hard to create a reputation uh, and that it doesn't transfer from one situation to another. Right? The fact that you don't act when the stakes are low uh, doesn't tell anybody what you'll do when the stakes are high, so why would they care? Um, in very, very recent years, there's been kind of a big pushback on that, and some of the most recent research is sort of uh, what you might call pro-reputation research, trying to reestablish the importance of reputation. Um, for the most part, you know, the, the best sources of creating credible deterrence commitments are to commit to things that really matter. So the more that there are obvious vital interests at stake, the more it tends to work. Um, and then a lot of these commitment tactics also seem to be very unreliable. It seems to be pretty hard to fake it um, if you don't have a real reason to, to carry out your commitments. The other, to my mind, big finding that came out of the thinking about rational deterrence theory is a very subtle one, but it's a very important one, and I'll, I'll have one of my few diagrams in this uh, slide deck on the next slide. But if we're thinking about costs and benefits, to say that I, I'm going to make the costs of your action outweigh the benefits of your action, that turns out to be incomplete in a very important way. So let's think about the decision problem from the point of view of the other side. Right? The other side is making a decision. They're making a choice. Right? And they're choosing, we're going to simplify it you know, grossly here, they're choosing between two alternative courses of action. Say launch an attack or refrain from launching attack. Do something or don't do something. Both of those two choices may have costs and benefits associated with them. Right? And so you can see where deterrence might fail even if the costs of action outweigh the benefits of action. You have to compare that cost-benefit equation against the cost-benefit equation on the other side. What if I don't act? What if I refrain from acting? If my estimate of the consequences of not acting is even more negative, by not acting I'm going to suffer terrible, terrible consequences, it may make sense to act even in the face of a deterrent threat, because th the pain you can impose on me is not as bad as the pain I'm going to suffer if I don't take action. So I tried to illustrate that here very briefly. So um, these two little chicken scratches coming down, this is called a decision tree. Um, this is a way of, of diagramming uh, a, a decision problem for somebody. Um, Right, and they have a choice of acting or not acting, attacking or not attacking, and they have costs and benefits associated with each. 
Right? If you think about just the, I'm going to try to persuade you not to act, right, we can deliberately threaten to increase the costs. That's deterrence by punishment. We can say we're going to deny you the benefits. That's deterrence by denial. And both of those should work to make the costs outweigh the benefits. But they can still fail if the decision calculus for refraining from action is even more negative, right? So if we attach completely arbitrary random numbers here, suppose that um, uh, acting would be worth plus five, but I can impose costs of 10. So now acting is worth minus five. It's a negative number, you shouldn't do it. The costs of action outweigh the benefits of action. You get negative utility, you shouldn't do it. Minus five is a bad payoff. But what if the payoff for not acting is minus 25? Now you're choosing between payoffs of minus 25 and minus five, Minus five is the rational choice. You're cutting your losses. Okay. So you have to think about the other side's costs and benefits associated with, re with restraint, or associated with not acting. Okay. And there are, we can play with both costs and benefits there. So, for example, we could try to increase the benefits of not acting. Right? We could give side payments or rewards of some kind. That's called a strategy of positive inducements or a strategy of positive incentives. But a lot of times what's driving the other side, what's motivating the other side, is their fears. Right? If I continue with the status quo, my status quo is in a downward spiral. Things are getting worse and worse and worse for me, and the future is looking really bleak. And I'm really afraid of the very high costs I'm going to pay in the future. Okay. So the other thing you can do is you can try to alleviate the other actor's fear of where the future is going for them. And we call that strategy assurance or reassurance. So as David mentioned, I've written uh, a little bit about the role of assurances as another type uh, of strategy. Right. And that is particularly called for if what the other side is afraid of is you. Right. They think you want to attack them, but, but you know you don't want to attack them. So now the problem is not to deter them. They're already afraid you're going to attack them. And you sort of build up your military forces and pile on more threats. You just make the situation worse. Right? The goal is to persuade them they're wrong. I don't want to attack you. Right? So that's reassurance. Right? And you have to sort of figure out some way to change their image of what your intentions is. Okay. Uh, rational actor model turns out to be fairly nice for kind of illustrating that problem, because you can put it up in a little diagram like this. OK, so along comes the third wave. Um, starts in the 1970s, runs through probably the 1990s. Uh, third wave has a few uh, distinctive characteristics. Um, I'm very steeped in the third wave because one of the most influential theorists in this body of work was a man named uh, Alexander George, who was my uh, dissertation advisor in graduate school. So we read his work cover to cover. I know it really well. Um, Deterrence theory uh, prior to this was very abstract. We don't have any cases of nuclear war to study, no case studies we can do, no history to look at, no data. So we're just sitting in our armchair and theorizing. So what these guys did is they said, OK, well, it's true that we don't have nuclear deterrence cases that we can study, but we can still look at conventional deterrence. Right? Lots and lots of cases of countries trying to deter other countries from launching conventional attacks and failing to do so. Let's do some research on those. At least we can learn something about deterrence that way. Uh, and the other thing that was really characteristic of the third wave is they were super skeptical of this rational actor assumption. Right? They looked at research in psychology. They looked at research in organizational behavior. Uh, they looked at research in bureaucratic politics. And they said, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that governments don't make rational decisions. Let's factor that into our theorizing about uh, deterrence. Uh, and so you get several kind of important findings that come out of the third wave, right? One of the scary ones is that you as the defender can do everything right. You can follow the checklist to a T, check every box to create a credible deterrent threat. But if the other side is suffering from some big misperception, it can all still go haywire. It can still fail. So deterrence is not a completely reliable strategy. It's not completely under your control, right? It's an influence strategy. It's not a control strategy. Okay. Um, so if you're going to use deterrence, rather than thinking of it as the final solution to your problems, maybe a better role for deterrence is really just to play for time. I'm going to try to hold the fort for as long as I can until I figure out some bigger uh, overarching solution to my problem. So you use deterrence to play for time until you can try to construct a larger diplomatic 
uh, solution that resolves the underlying sources of conflict, the underlying sources of grievance, uh, and then takes away the need for uh, deterrence. So the argument that George and other third wave theorists made is that if we're going to theorize about deterrence, we shouldn't actually be looking only at deterrence, but we should be looking at the whole toolkit. Right, what are all the different influence strategies? What are all the different diplomatic strategies that are out there? And we need a kind of big picture st uh, theory, um, part of which is essentially a theory of um, policy prescription. So if you think about a menu of choices, um, when do you order the deterrence entree? And when do you order some other entree like diplomacy or engagement or positive incentives or, or reassurance? Right, what's the right meal to serve at the right time? Is this a deterrent situation or not? Right, how long can I make deterrence work in this situation? So we broaden out from looking just at deterrence uh, to also looking at deterrence in relationship to other alternative strategies. So one of the really uh, big things to come out of the third wave, and this is work of Robert Jervis, and I think if uh, I am correct, you put this on the syllabus, um, one of the arguments is that deterrence theory, uh, the social science language for it would be deterrence theory didn't define its scope conditions. In other words, it didn't tell you when you need it. Right? Because it was written in a Cold War context, because it was written when the Soviet Union existed, nuclear weapons existed, the Cold War existed, theorists just assumed that we need deterrence. We're already in the deterrence game. How do we play it? Right? And they never stepped back, and they never said, when is deterrence called for? And when does it make sense to order something else from the menu? When does it make sense to pick a different influence strategy, uh, assurances, engagement, et cetera? Um, so Jervis picked up the mantle there, and he made a very simple distinction between two different scenarios that you might be in, one of which he called the deterrence model, uh, in which case deterrence strategies are a good prescription. Uh, and the alternative is the spiral model. Uh, and it turns out that if, if you're caught in the spiral model, uh, deterrence is not uh, such a good uh, prescription. Okay. So, uh, and the way in which you tell which situation you're in is primarily based on your intelligence assessment of the other side. Right? So if the adversary you're dealing with is in fact greedy, they're expansionist in some way, they want to make gains at your expense, and they're opportunistic, Right, they're looking for windows of opportunity to jump through. They're probing for weaknesses. They're probing for gaps where they can take advantage of things. And they are, in fact, reasonably rational. They see the world more or less as it is. Um, then deterrence is a really good recommendation. Right? You want to convince them that, that you're going to resist their expansion. You can make them pay a price. You have the capabilities to do it. You have the will to do it. And they can understand your deterrent commitment and back down and respect it. Alternatively, if what the other side's uh, intentions are driven by is their own pervasive sense of insecurity, uh, their own preoccupation with their various domestic political problems, or if they suffer from really uh, enormous sources of misperception that can't be corrected, then deterrence is likely uh, to fail. And potentially even worse, uh, deterrence might be provocative. Right? So, one of the really um, complicating uh, implications of the spiral model is that we have two quite different pathways to bad outcomes with deterrence. Right? So you could have a situation in which deterrence is actually a good idea. I want to deter somebody from doing something because they really are planning to do it. Uh, but unfortunately, deterrence still fails. Um, you tried to deter them, and they ignored the deterrent threat, and they went ahead. But you can also have situations in which deterrence is misdiagnosed. You prescribe deterrence, but it was the wrong strategy. Right? If the other side is already driven by the fear that you are a threat, if the other side is already driven by their own insecurity, and you now issue a much bigger set of threats towards them, you just make their insecurity worse. You now make them even more desperate to change the status quo. Right? So in those situations, deterrence doesn't just fail. It actively makes the situation worse. It provokes a worse outcome than you would have gotten if you didn't try it. And so you have to think about two very different scenarios. They both have bad outcomes, but the sources of the bad outcome is different. Right? And one, deterrence was the right thing to do, but somehow you couldn't make it work. In which case, your question is, how can I strengthen deterrence? 
But in spiral model situations, deterrence is the wrong thing to do. And by trying to implement it, you immediately make the situation worse. So you have to step back and you have to ask yourself, am I in a situation where deterrence is the right recommendation or not? All right, so where does the fourth wave come from? Fourth wave sort of starts in the 1990s with the end of the Cold War, but really, it's really a 21st century um, uh, time period. Right? It, it really is, is motivated probably by 9-11 more than anything else. So the Cold War ends. We get maybe two or three weeks where we get a kickback and say, woohoo, I don't have to work on deterrence anymore. We don't need it. World peace is broken out. That doesn't last very long. Uh, and a whole set of new things comes along uh, to create new challenges for deterrence. Uh, internal ethnic conflicts in various countries, uh, various so-called rogue states going after WMD, North Korea most recently, uh, global suicide terrorism becoming very prominent obviously after 9-11, uh, the realm of cyber attacks and oh my god can we do cyber deterrence. Right. And then most recently, all of this hybrid warfare, gray zone conflict stuff that is a complete nightmare from the perspective of, of deterrence planning. <coughs> right. So collectively, these generate a fourth wave of research, and in some ways, it's very parallel to the first wave in Bernard Brody, right? it's policy driven. Here's the atom bomb. We better think about how to deter it. Here's a whole new set of challenges we didn't think about during the Cold War. Back to the drawing board. How do we deter these? Okay. Uh, the fourth wave also uh, has been uh, a term that's been used to also depict a couple other trends in the literature. Um, there's been a lot of updating of the old rational deterrence literature based on um, new developments in the techniques of game theory. Some people have designated that as being part of the fourth wave. Uh, and then I don't know if you study any international relations theory here or not, but uh, there's a body of uh, theorizing in the field of IR more broadly called social constructivism and people attempting to apply social constructivism to the study of deterrence uh, is also part of the fourth wave. Okay. So here's some key findings, um, one of which is that deterrence has actually never gone away, it's still with us. So if we remember back to the early 2000s and the so-called Bush Doctrine, uh, President Bush after 9-11 gave a series of speeches and there was a bunch of documents that came up that articulated a doctrine of preemption. And it basically said, we can't count on deterrence working anymore in a world of terrorists and rogue states. We're going to just go out and preempt threats. Um, we practiced that in Iraq, but we didn't really practice it anywhere else. For the most part, we still use deterrence, uh, including um, even some attempts to try to figure out how to deter terrorism. What is true is that we can't count on deterrence being 100% effective, right? With nuclear weapons at, at the highest level, we better get 100%. Even one deterrence failure is, is too catastrophic to contemplate. You're never going to get 100% effectiveness in most of these scenarios we're dealing with now, right? You're not going to deter 100% of cyber attacks. You're not going to deter 100% of terrorist attacks. But maybe you can get some benefits at the margins, right? Maybe you can deter some bad people from doing some bad things. And that's worth doing if you can do it. So deterrence is not going away. It's going to stay as one tool in the toolkit. But because we can't count on it doing 100% of the job, um, it's not going to be the long pole in the tent anymore. Or it's not going to be the primary driver of strategy in these scenarios. It's going to be one tool in a toolkit that has a lot of other tools that we're also going to be using a lot. And just because the Cold War ended and the world changed doesn't mean that everything came before gets thrown out. We did a lot of hard work in the Cold War to come up with some ideas, some concepts, some analytical frameworks for thinking about deterrence. Right? And we can still talk about the difference between punishment and denial. We can still talk about the difference between deterrence and compellence. We can still talk about the sources of credibility. Right? We can still talk about whether or not it makes sense to apply the rational actor assumptions. Well, a lot of our analytical tools still work, even if the empirical reality that we're applying them to uh, is different. Uh, the main thing we need to do is, is to work on broadening our approach. So it's not so much that we're throwing out what we did before, it's still relevant, but now we need to think about non-military tools we might apply along with military tools. We need to about think about deterring non-state actors and not just state actors. We need to think about deterring types of attack other than military attack. We need to broaden the, the conceptual framework, the, the research from what we had before. Okay. 
So I'm going to take a slight detour here um, and go back to the Cold War period. So one long-running debate is sort of the utility of this rational actor assumption. Right? And as I said, the third wave was really the big critique here. And it drew primarily on findings from psychology to challenge the rational actor assumption. But in the policy world, there was a second line of critique uh, that developed a term called strategic culture. And this dates back to the 1970s. Uh, that's Nikita Khrushchev banging his shoe at the UN, for those of you. I'm not sure anybody in the room is old enough to remember that, but uh, back in the day. Um, and the theory, well, the idea here was, as we started to learn some things about the Soviet Union, there were some troubling indicators that they maybe didn't think about nuclear weapons in the same way as the United States. That claim also, by the way, is very controversial, and there's been a number of people who, who dispute that. But if you thought that that was true, right, then assuming kind of a generic kind of rationality that applied to everybody wasn't going to work because different people have different utility functions, different people have different value systems, and hence, even if they're engaging in cost-benefit analysis, their cost-benefit analysis doesn't look like yours. You can't mirror image the other side. Right? That's the basic idea here. And so the argument was... You need to learn about how the other side thinks, you know, by delving deeply into what was called their strategic culture. Right? And that is still a recurring debate and, a rec and an ongoing line of research today. Um, so if you hear debates about Iran, right, can, you know, if Iran ever gets to the point where they have uh, broken out and they achieve nuclear weapons, you know, will they be deterred from using them just like all the other nuclear states? Or is Iran somehow fundamentally different? They're religious fanatics, they have a cult of suicide, etc., uh, and they'll be more dangerous than everybody else who came before. Um, we won't know unless and until it happens, but that's sort of the gist of, of the debate. Okay. So a lot of this um, uh, ends up coming up in the context of, of deterring the so-called rogue states, the Irans and North Koreas and Syrias of the world. right? And in the uh, U.S. Uh, strategic doctrine, this leads to the emergence of, of what's called tailored deterrence. Um, a lot of this, I think, is, is incorrect historically. We never had a one-size-fits-all deterrent, but the argument is that we used to rely on a one-size-fits-all. We'll just nuke everybody if they misbehave, but now we're going to tailor deterrence to specific actors uh, and try to I identify their value system and hold at risk what they value most. Okay. Um, my, cha my thinking is changing a little bit based on a project I'm working on right now, but my initial reaction to tailored deterrence was to actually be pretty skeptical. Um, I think sometimes you're better off having some fairly simple generic deterrent threats that are clear to everybody rather than trying to have very carefully hand-tailored messages to go to each individual actor because then you rely, you're putting a lot of weight on communications being clear and there's a lot of potential for the sort of signal to get lost in the noise. Right? And my key takeaway has always been don't ask who you are trying to deter as the first question, like, oh, my God, how do we deter North Korea? Ask what you want to deter. Right? Where do you want to draw the red lines? What's the behavior that you really care about? And then figure out how you would deter that behavior. And then if you want to, maybe you could add a little tailoring at the end to kind of, well, what do I need to tell North Korea specifically uh, to convince them not to use their nuclear weapons? Okay, well, I'm running later, so I'm going to skip, skip a couple slides. Um, let me end with sort of a couple comments about nuclear deterrence. Right. Um, some diplomatic historians have, have referred to the period since 1945 as the long peace. Right? We had two very brutal world wars in the first half of the 20th century. We haven't had any great power, major power conflicts that are equivalent to that uh, since then. And maybe that's because of nuclear weapons. Right? Nuclear deterrence is really powerful. Who would want to start a war when it might turn nuclear? Well, surprise, surprise. We don't have consensus about that either. There are people who disagree. Um, John Mueller, for example, says there was no World War III because the Soviets weren't really ever all that expansionist. Once they had captured Eastern Europe, they were happy. They didn't need more. No reason to fight. Right. And so you have to ask, why hasn't nuclear war happened? And I think it's actually a combination of factors. 
in part, it's because you had leaders who were aware of what a nuclear war would mean and who, when they got close to the brink, they got scared and they behaved carefully. So if you know the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, it begins with some very reckless behavior by Nikita Khrushchev. But the more the stakes get higher, uh, both President Kennedy in the U.S. and Premier Khrushchev in the Soviet Union feel the responsibility of, I don't want to be the leader who started a nuclear war. And they get together and they sort of work out a diplomatic solution, pretty much overruling their more hawkish advisors on both sides. Right? Um, there's a sense of nuclear taboo, a norm that has developed that, that nuclear weapons really are different and you just don't use them. Right? I have to say, when I read the diplomatic history, I think we got lucky. There were a lot of close calls that could have gone the other way, and fortunately they didn't. Okay. And maybe a learning process over time, right? how to behave in ways that keep us further away from the brink. Um, but that said, I think it's hard to imagine history since 1945 without nuclear weapons. I don't think it would turn out the same way. Nuclear weapons do scare people. They do make people cautious. And so for me, this is really more of a trade-off question. Right? If nuclear deterrence is fairly effective and it adds to stability, but it's not foolproof, it could fail, um, do you sort of take the benefits of reducing the chances of major conventional war at some small but non-zero risk of one day having the ultimate catastrophe? How do you weigh those trade-offs? It's a value judgment. right? This is not a, a question to which there's an inherently objective answer. Right? It's what do you fear more? Okay. Uh, the nuclear issue hasn't gone away. Um, deterrence is broader than nuclear weapons. If you only remember one thing from my talk, hopefully that's what you'll remember. Uh, but that said, we still try to do things with our nuclear weapons that are primarily deterrent in nature. Uh, so our nuclear strategy still involves deterrence. And there's a lot of ongoing debates, and I'm not going to try to answer these for you. I think these are things that will probably come up over the course of the semester uh, in your class. But what's the mission for nuclear weapons? Are we just trying to deter people from using their nuclear weapons, or are we trying to deter more bad behaviors than just nuclear attack? Right. Do we need new nuclear weapons to do this, or is the existing arsenal basically uh, sufficient? Um, are there advantages to having nuclear superiority, uh, or as long as you have second strike capabilities, that's all you need? Um, right. Uh, and let's suppose that one day we want to get rid of the nuclear weapons. What happens then? Can we maintain deterrence? Can we maintain stability as we move to uh, a nuclear-free world? Okay. And of course, if we don't want deterrence, what are the alternatives? Right? There are alternatives both to the more hawkish side. We can move to preemption, missile defenses, and so forth. Uh, and there are, are alternatives to a more dovish side, more reliance on diplomacy, engagement, uh, looking for nuclear abolition, etc. All right, so I think this is the last slide. Okay. So deterrence is not going away. It's always been part of the human experience. It always will be. Um, uh, it's kind of like the, the old joke that people sometimes make about the opposite sex, can't live with it, can't live without it. Um, I don't think there's any way to make it foolproof. It's always going to be fallible. There's always going to be a risk of deterrence failure. Right? Uh, so... Um, it's possible to come be become very obsessed with deterrence, to spend all your time worrying about your reputation, how you communicate resolve, how you establish credibility. And if you suck all of strategy into the obsessive pursuit of credibility, you're distorting your thinking. You're, you're taking one ingredient that's one element of one strategy, and you're, you're having it drive the whole train, which is not, not the right way to do strategy. For me, the most important question is still the what question. Where do you draw the red line? What is it you really want to deter? Um, we live in a world where we can't deter every type of bad behavior. Some things we're just going to have to live with or, or just try to deal with them diplomatically. Right? And so we need to know where are our priorities. Okay. Um, there's still work to do with deterrence. Right? We can be creative. We can try to broaden our thinking. We can try to look for new approaches. We can draw on academic research to inform uh, those uh, new approaches. Um, there's still a lot of really big picture questions and debates about nuclear weapons that aren't answered, that, that um, successive generations coming through institutions like this one are going to get to wrestle with and think about. Um, and uh, I was only ever invited to speak at STRATCOM once, and uh, this may be why. Um, I went up there and I told them that deterrence is not really about warheads on foreheads. Uh, I never got invited back. Um, 
it's not a targeting problem primarily, right? It's a, deterrence is an influence strategy. It's what do I need to do to influence somebody else to change their mind about what they're going to do. Being able to hold certain targets at risk, that's part of it, but it's not fundamentally driven by the targeting issue. Uh, and then finally, because deterrence doesn't always work, and because in fact sometimes it's misdiagnosed and it's used in situations where it's counterproductive, we need to have alternatives in the toolkit. We need to think about not just deterrence, but what are my alternatives to deterrence? What else can I do in situations where I think deterrence uh, is not going to work? All right, and with that, I am very happy to take questions. And if you don't get your question answered now, this is my contact info. Uh, and the email address down there is the best thing to use to reach me. And I'm, I'm very good about answering emails, so I'm happy to take questions from email as well as uh, questions in person. All right, thank you. Way in the back. Good morning, sir. Commander Sylvia from uh, Seminar 4. Uh, looking at the global economy where I can't live without uh, Chinese goods and services, how does that play into deterrence with countries uh, that we want to deter with nuclear weapons when we need their, their economies mm -hmm. to work for us? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So we live in a world of very high levels of economic interdependence. Right? We committed to free trade and, and is now a globalized economy uh, and as much as uh, the current U.S. administration is trying to pull back from that uh, those those um, uh, interconnections, they're too far developed, right? We can't. It, that, that's, that train left the station many, many years ago. It's not going back. It's sort of a good news, bad news situation. On the one hand, um, there are reasons to believe that high levels of economic interdependence uh, probably make conflict less likely to begin with because now anybody who starts a conflict is disrupting a mutually beneficial economic relationship. Uh, and so it disincentivizes conflict. It doesn't eliminate the possibility of conflict. There was a lot of interdependence before World War I, and it still happened. But it makes it less likely. Um, but it also complicates deterrence planning because it makes it harder to make those threats credible. Well, would I really stop bombing you when, when you hold half my dollars you know, in your banks and I buy all of my products from you? Um, so maybe I, you know, maybe I was a little too dismissive of the role of targeting in the in the last slide, right? It's you have to figure out what are the the targets that that you could feasibly hold at risk that hopefully wouldn't be too damaging to the economic relationship, uh, but would hit the Chinese uh, in places that uh, they would find disagreeable. Um, so maybe. Um, you know, all those fake islands they're trying to build in the South China Sea or something like that, which have no real economic role, uh, but which they wouldn't want to lose that investment. Um, and I'd also think in non-military terms here, right? Um, uh, could you do things working with other countries in the region uh, that would isolate China diplomatically or economically by improving relationships with the ASEAN countries or something like that? Other questions? Yes. Colonel Allen, Seminar 2. So given the nuclear test ban treaty, so we haven't detonated a nuclear mm -hmm. weapon in over a quarter century, and also the fact, if you look at the, nat the nuclear posture review, we haven't uh, invested, the, as the other great powers have, in modernization of our nuclear weapons in our triad. So North Korea is obviously nuclear, now deterrence mm -hmm. failed there. Is there a tipping point where the guys under our nuclear umbrella, like Japan and South Korea, may decide to proliferate? Mm -hmm. And what do you think those tipping points would be, and what's the tr strategic impact of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a bunch of questions, but they're all really good questions. Um, uh, <coughs> speaking personally, I'm a supporter of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I think it, um, you know, except for North Korea, everybody else uh, has been pretty much observing it since the uh, end of the 1990s, so it constrains everybody's nuclear modernization efforts. Um, uh, and I don't totally agree with your premise that we're not engaged in modernization. We're spending an awful lot of money in next generation platforms that just haven't come online yet. Um, but it is true that, that, that there is a risk of further nuclear uh, proliferation, additional states acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, and um, in the near term future, South Korea is probably the greatest risk because of you know, what's been happening in North Korea. Um, South Korea and Japan are a little bit different. Japan uh, technologically is a lot more advanced. They've got massive piles of 
plutonium just sitting around as a byproduct of their civil nuclear program that could be applied to nuclear weapons. Um, but they also have more domestic constraints against nuclear weapons because they have a national identity uh, as the only country that ever had the atom bomb used against them. So domestic public opinion in Japan is still overwhelmingly pretty anti-nuclear. Um, South Korea doesn't have that constraint. You look at the public opinion polling in South Korea, and for quite some time now, clear majorities have wanted South Korea to go nuclear. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there's um, a few things that, that restrain both of them. Um, security assurances from the United States, probably the single most important thing, right? If there's any countries where the nuclear umbrella from the United States matters, it's those two. Right, and if they come to doubt uh, that, that our extended deterrent commitments to them would be good, that would probably be the single biggest thing that would get them to reconsider. Uh, in Japan's case, they still have a lot of domestic political constraints to overcome because of that, that sense of national identity. Um, and in the case of both countries, you know, they are members of a larger uh, non-proliferation regime. So there's a nuclear non-proliferation treaty and then a bunch of other architecture out there in the world that, that both these countries are members of. And um, there are typically uh, economic and diplomatic penalties for countries that withdraw from those arrangements. Right? So if you look at all the economic sanctions that were imposed on Iran, for example, uh, South Korea and Japan, although it wouldn't be as severe with them because we have friendlier relations with them, they would have to anticipate that they would get a lot of, of economic and diplomatic pushback if they start to go uh, nuclear. So that, you know, my sense is that the, the tipping point is still on the non-nuclear side for these guys because of all the disincentives. Um, but if the North Korean program continues to progress, and if something causes them, you know, something happens that causes them to start to have doubts about the U.S. nuclear umbrella, um, there would be very, very serious internal studies and debates about whether or not to go nuclear at that point. Um, you know, depending on what happens with Iran, that also could have a, equivalent impacts in the Middle East, right? If Iran, um, now that the United States is pulling back from the nuclear deal, Iran reacts to that with a serious resumption of its nuclear activities, uh, and they look like they're getting close to the breakout point, you know, I think the Saudis at least would reconsider their situation, although they'd be starting from much further behind than uh, South Korea or Japan technologically. Um, other questions? Uh, let's go way off to that side. Uh, yes, sir. I'm Jordan Murphy from Seminar Suite 16. Uh, my question to you, you talked a lot about credibility. Do you mm -hmm. believe our nuclear deterrent lost credibility after September 11th uh, when we didn't detonate any kind of weapon, or even a, like a low-yield weapon in Tora Bora or something like that? No, because I don't, I don't think nuclear weapons had any um, applicability to that situation. Um, it would be, I think most of the world would have seen it as a really disproportionate response, right? We had a relatively small non-state actor um, figure out weaknesses in our uh, air, airline security and uh, uh, kill about 3,000 people by hijacking four airplanes, and we, we set off a nuke. It, it would just have been seen as, you know, way over the top uh, reaction. Um, so, no, I mean, I think, you know, the fact that we um, gave the Taliban a chance to uh, turn over bin Laden and, and roll up the camps in Afghanistan and then, um, you know, invaded the country and, and kicked the Taliban out of power and pursued bin Laden until we got him, you know, those are actions that should have uh, helped U.S. credibility, right? We were attacked. We took appropriate uh, measures in response. We made the people who attacked us uh, pay a price. Um, you know, uh, I, th uh, I guess this may be a little political. Um, I mean, I think where we hurt ourselves was by not sticking to Afghanistan and then immediately turning around and going into Iraq uh, as well. Um, you know, and now we looked like the aggressor, uh, and we created conditions that gave rise to al-Qaeda in Iraq, which uh, metastasized into ISIS, and we made our problem worse. Uh, and I think we would have been better off keeping our focus just on al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan at that point. <laughs> Mike Salmon, Seminar 12. Hey, sir, I got a question in terms of cost. Uh, at what point does the nuclear triad become too expensive? I mean, how many 100 kiloton weapons do you mm -hmm. actually need? Is mm -hmm. that fair, in your opinion? Um, I think that's a really important question. Um, 
That's probably a question that, that uh, I mean, nuclear weapons are w one of the many ways in which nuclear weapons are an, a unique challenge is that nuclear weapons can also be a challenge for democracy. Right? A lot of, the, of what happens in the nuclear enterprise happens in secret. Uh, and a lot of people who are at high levels of decision making, uh, either in the civilian political system or the, the <coughs> upper echelons of the military, um, don't necessarily want to encourage public debate about nuclear weapons. But you know how much money we want to spend on nuclear weapons versus other priorities. You know it's up to voters and, and taxpayers and their elected representatives to make those uh, decisions. So um, one thing I wish is that we actually had more. Um, easily publicly available information about nuclear weapons and their costs and, and the different arguments for and against different platforms uh, so that people could debate that and decide where they want to spend their money. Um, you know, I am convinced of the need to do at least some modernization, and kind of loop back to the earlier question. Uh, I'm not sure that the amount we're trying to invest in all three legs of the triad is, is financially sustainable. And we you know, may have to do a little bit of triage on the triad and decide where we're investing and, and where we're not. Um, you know, if you follow the conventional wisdom, I uh, hate to say it at an Air Force establishment, but the submarine leg is probably the most important. That's still considered the most survivable. Uh, and th then the choice is if you go down to a dyad rather than a triad, do you get rid of the ICBMs or do you get rid of the bombers? There's trade-offs either way. Mm -hmm. Hello, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Esteve from France. There is one thing was not, which was not mentioned in the theory you presented, uh, which is the public opinion role in the use of the, the nuclear weapons. What is your view on that in the modern world? I mean, today, how would we use and how would it be perceived, especially by the public opinion? And when you think about public opinion, you think about the politics. What's mm -hmm. your view on that, please? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. That's a great question. And that's actually a question that I've been interested in for a long time. So um, uh, uh, David sort of omitted the more peacenik part of my biography, I think, probably in, in uh, hopes of uh, uh, preserving my credibility. But um, uh, I got into this field of study because I participated in uh, some of the anti-nuclear weapons activism of the early 1980s when the nuclear freeze movement uh, was briefly very popular in the United States. And I've always been interested in what is the role of the public in, uh, you know, in these discussions. Um, it's a double-edged sword, I think, is the short answer. Um, so at some points in time, uh, public opinion in the United States and, and world opinion around the world um, exercises constraining effects, and in particular the sense of the nuclear taboo is maintained in part because there's a, a perception that, right, we can think of this as a, as a type of deterrent effect even, right, why don't you make more nuclear threats, why don't you introduce nuclear weapons first into tactical situations, right, it's in part because there's a sense of taboo about this, and there's an expectation that the first country to violate the taboo will be criticized very strongly and loudly around the world, that world public opinion will turn against this, and that anticipation of a negative world public opinion exercises some deterrent effect. Um, but the flip side of this is there's some very recent research um, that um, another one of my mentors, Scott Sagan, at Stanford University and some of his collaborators have carried out where they've done public opinion surveys. Uh, and they've discovered, um, somewhat shockingly, that there's a number of scenarios in which large majorities of US public opinion um, would support the first use of nuclear weapons in certain scenarios, if it was necessary to prevent al-Qaeda from getting a nuclear weapon, if it was necessary to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, and so uh, public opinion may not be the main uh, keeper of the nuclear taboo these days. It really may be more of an elite level uh, kind of thing where the public is not so invested in it anymore. Want to come up? It looks like one's not working. Uh, that's okay, sir. I think it'll work. Sir, thank you so much on behalf of the class for spending time with us today and your expertise. We greatly appreciate that. As a rational actor and in the hopes <laughs> to persuade you to come back and build our credibility, uh, we'd be honored if you'd accept our class call. Oh, very much so. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> thank you.